Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the Sales Hacker webinar. Uh, my name is Scott Barker and I am the Head of Partnerships here at Sales Hacker. Uh, we're super excited to be discussing five simple steps to building an outbound growth machine. Uh, before we jump into it uh, and some introductions, I wanted to take care of a few housekeeping matters. So number one, uh, we will be recording this session and it will be available afterwards in case you need to jump off or you feel you want to you know, share it out with a colleague. Uh, as you know, uh, we love our webinars to be interactive. So with this in mind, uh, we just ask you two things. So feel free to jump onto the chat feature, introduce yourself, uh, your name, your title, company, the size of your sales team, because uh, we do want to hear from you. <laughs> our panelists are here for you. So please ask questions as we go uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, we will either ask them right in the moment uh, if it's relevant, uh, or at the end, depending on how the conversation is going and with flow. Um, you can ask questions in the questions section uh, of uh, GoToWebinar. So now that we have that out of the way, uh, I would like to introduce our guest presenter. I am joined by Ben Raffi, uh, founder and CEO of Grow Labs. Ben, thanks so much for joining us. How's your Monday going so far? It's good. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're, uh, we're lucky to have you. Uh, so I'm looking yeah. forward to jumping into this topic with you. Uh, you know, it's something that's near and dear to my heart for sure. I'm very familiar with this. Um, but before we do that, uh, I just wanted to jump into your background a little bit here uh, because you've been able to do some really cool things uh, throughout your career. Uh, so we were, we were speaking last week. And so you were the founder of Universe. Uh, and it's my understanding that uh, you were able to scale that team to 46 people. Uh, across four offices and three countries, uh, boasting 800% year-over-year growth, uh, and you guys were actually eventually acquired by Ticketmaster. That's, yeah, uh, that's that must have been quite quite the ride. Yeah, that was quite the ride. Um, and yeah, so I started the company in Toronto and then moved to San Francisco about three years later uh, to build a sales and partnerships team. And we didn't have too much. We only had like two sales reps and really built an outbound machine. Uh, and we actually converted 28,000 clients uh, in two and a half years. Uh, so we're very, very successful at it. Uh, and that definitely, uh, you know, T Ticketmaster and Live Nation were definitely interested in, in what we had built. And so it, fit, it felt like a, it was a good partnership. And then, you know, partnership discussions after partnership discussion ended up, uh, they ended up acquiring us, which was a definitely a crazy adventure. I bet, that's, that's amazing. And then from there, you, you went on to advise many organizations uh, in the Bay Area, uh, specifically on how to grow outbound sales teams. Uh, That's correct. And a lot of that advice we'll actually be discussing today. Um, and then finally, last but you know, definitely not least, uh, you're now the founder and CEO uh, at Grow Labs, which is an all-in-one B2B sales automation and lead generation company. So you're a, you're a busy guy, eh? <laughs> Try to be. <laughs> awesome. Well, with that, uh, I'll hand the reins over to you, uh, and you can uh, kick us off. Let's dive into it. Great. Great. Well, thanks for, again, thanks for having me, and thanks everyone who's uh, listening. Um, so, you know, as uh, Scott mentioned, my name is Ben Raffi. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder at Grow Labs. Um, we'll be, you know, taking questions during the, the presentation, but definitely feel free to reach out to me at the end. We'll have a, a bit of time for Q&A, uh, but also, you know, Ben at GrowLabs.com. Uh, more than happy to answer your questions after the, after the webinar is over as well. Um, so, you know, we went through some of this already, uh, but ca kind of like better background about me. I started my, my career in management consulting at the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, so at the bottom of the slide, uh, spent about six years building Universe, uh, we then was, were acquired by Live Nation and Ticketmaster. Uh, I'm a growth advisor and consultant for a bunch of uh, startups here in the Bay Area. And in the past uh, year, year and a half, I've been uh, growing a new company. It's called Grow Labs. And basically, it's an outbound B2B sales automation and lead generation. Uh, so we work with B2B companies all over the world, and we help them acquire uh, new clients. And so, um, so, I don't know if I can, hey, there we go. So, um, yeah, so I've split today's uh, webinar into five different sections. Um, there's obviously a lot to cover, uh, so I'll move quite fast, uh, but you'll have access to the presentation uh, at the end as well. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about 
uh, and is how to identify and segment your ideal customer into what I call micro-segments. Uh, then uh, we'll talk about how to establish channels to acquire leads in each of these micro-segments. Uh, we'll also cover you know, how to set up a very efficient funnel. And then finally, I'll go over to measure, optimize, and scale uh, your effort as you, uh, as you build uh, and scale things up uh, into a very powerful sales engine. Um, so here's the framework that uh, we've built here in Tenorio at Grow Labs. Uh, it may seem a little bit overwhelming at first, uh, but I promise when we get go through this webinar, you'll, you'll get a good sense of, of what this is like. And it's actually not that, that difficult if you split it into small pieces. Uh, and this is actually the framework that is enabling us to grow extremely fast at Grow Labs and generate about $35,000 of uh, qualified pipeline every single day for each of our sales rep. Um, wow. A large number. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's very 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 exciting time right now. Um, so yeah, so the first step, uh, the first piece is to identify your most attractive markets and split them into micro segments. And I see that all over the time, like people, you know, try to go to market too fast without really understanding who they're going after. But to really effectively scale up your operations, you really need to understand who you're trying to target and build a small a smart customer segmentation strategy. Uh, so there are a lot of benefits of doing that. Uh, the first one is that you're going to be increasing your conversion. Uh, the more focused your messaging, the more focused your campaigns are, uh, the higher the conversion are going to be. Uh, and second, you're going to improve the financial efficiency. Uh, and that's really important because basically you'll be offering the right product to the right type of customers. Uh, and then you'll be able to price it uh, at the right price by understanding the value that you, you, you're deriving, uh, that the customers are deriving from your product. And then uh, the third point is, uh, the third benefit is that uh, you're going to start creating snowball effects. It's very, very hard to create snowball effects if you're going after every single business or every single uh, person out there. If you're able to nail a couple of segments and then get word of mouth going into the segments, then you're going to create mini snowball across different segments and that's how you'll be able to, to, to benefit from that. Uh, and the final step, and it's one of the, I would say, the most important, especially in early stage startups, is that you'll be able to improve your product by going into a very specific market, understanding the needs of this market, the value that people are getting from your product. Again, you'll be able to get very specific feedback about what people use it for, what is valuable to them, and you'll be able to refine your product a lot faster. Awesome. Does that, does that make all sense? Yeah, for sure. So when you talk about you know, helping improve your product, is that you know, your BDR, your SDR who are on the front lines, you're making sure that you're capturing all of the information that they're hearing on the front lines back towards yeah. your marketing team? Yeah, absolutely. So it's both from you know the sales and business development, uh, so you know capturing things that people are asking for, uh, how people are you know are trying to understand the product, but also from you know the customer success team, the onboarding team, the renewal team. It's always really important to close the loop because you know you can sell them a lot of churn. Like what's really important is people as they use your product uh, get valuable feedback into the use cases. Where are they seeing uh, good results? Where are they like kind of like uh, stumbling upon like you know things or bugs that that you can fix. Uh, so I think it's really throughout the entire life cycle of of the marketing, the sales team, and then all the way to the customer success team. Got it. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. And then the one other thing I was just gonna dive into, and you may be getting to this in at, at some point later. But so you you've gone in, you've found uh, you know the the attractive markets, you've broken that down into micro segments. Are you then going a step further and setting up personas for each of those micro segments? Yeah, absolutely, and we'll, we'll go through this, uh, but it's very important to create different personas for each of the micro segments, and then from there, you actually write an entire you know, messaging, an entire strategy of how you're going to go after them, and all the way down to the funnel. The funnel may be very different depending on the personas, like if you're selling to you know, the C-level, uh, it might be really different than if you have to sell to you know, the VP of, of Tim and Jen or something like this. Um, so based on that, based on each person, else, the strategy, the messaging, and the flow might be, might be different. Right. Okay. Makes sense. 
Um, and so basically what you want to do when you create those macro segments is you want to segment it based on value and really the value that people are going to see from using your product, whether it's a positive ROI, whether, whether it's an increased velocity, uh, it's really important to base on value because this is what's going to generate the most long-term profit for your clients. And you know, the way I like to think about it is like the more value you create, the more money you're likely uh, the p people are likely to pay for your product. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so the process uh, to, you know, segment you, your, your customers and segment your market, uh, the, first, the, first piece, um, the first piece is to come up with hypothesis. And so really thinking about, like, uh, what are the high-level assumptions as to, like, which benefits customers will get from your uh, product? And then you would want to generate a, a list of all of your clients, your customers to date. Uh, you know, you may want to remove outliers, like people that are too recent or too old, or maybe some special partnerships that you did. Uh, and then you'd want to research all of the attributes. So basically, you know, what are the revenue, the company sizes, anything that you can uh, find about your customers. Uh, once you have the data, you would want to analyze the data and group people into ideal customer profile. That's where you kind of like your personas. Uh, come and so here you want to. So this is just a screenshot of our, our platform, actually, where we're looking at you know what are the industries uh, that our clients are in, what are the job titles of the people we're selling into. So you can see there's a bunch of like marketing managers, sales managers, uh, the location obviously, uh, but all the way down to like hey, what are the technology that people are using? Like we realize that oh, like 55% of our of our clients use Shopify, and 88% use Salesforce. So if you so if you have those kind of attributes, then you might realize that you know there's interesting messaging or interesting features uh, that your product needs. Um, so it's very, very valuable to get that information early on if you can. Cool. And you know what I like about that is that you know by the looks of it it's it's constantly evolving, right? It's not just a exactly. uh, where you're just finding your ICP once you get, you know, your whole team in a room for three hours and you uh, you know, bang out a big exercise, and then you're like, okay, that's our ICP, and then you don't revisit it. This way, you know, one hundred percent, constantly it's, uh, bubbling up as new information comes. Yeah, it, you have to reiterate it. You have to, you know, constantly get feedback from your team, from the clients, and you know, as the market evolves as well, as there's new competition, as there's new technologies, you need to reevaluate that constantly. It's almost like you know, uh, a living document, kind of like your business plan. As a small business owner, you have a business plan. It needs to change and evolve with all of these those those dynamics and, uh, and changes. Totally, awesome. Great, and so once you've done this, you want to evaluate uh, the attractiveness of each segment. And basically, you know, the goal is to find, um, you know, is to develop a formula uh, to measure the attractiveness of each segment. Uh, and so the type of criteria that you could have, obviously, would be like, you know, the size of the segment, like how many companies are in, in each of these buckets, uh, what is the profit per company that you can get, uh, what is the likelihood to convert. Um, one that I really like to include into that formula is the what I call like the targetability, like how easy is it to target these people? Can you find them easily? Can you find the companies that match those criteria? Because obviously if you can't, uh, then it's really, really difficult to get into them. Uh, and one as well that I really like is the sales cycle length. Like how many months does it take on average to close, you know, a very small or like a medium-sized client versus a Fortune 500 client, uh, and, and kind of like working that into your formula will, will make you decide if you need to go after them now or if that's something you need to focus on uh, later. Nice, yeah, I like that, taking account the, the sales cycle because, you know, they could be the ideal customer for you, you know, they might be, have a huge deal size with you, but if it's taking you you know, nine months just to uh, get in front of them. That's something they have to take into account. Exactly, and especially you know, for small startups, like nine months is a very, very long time. Like you may be out of business before you get your, you know, your first deal closed. So it's important to get revenue earlier on at, uh, sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Get some and then, small wins while you're chasing the whales. Exactly, uh, and you know, get feedback on your product. Is or, or like the faster you can get feedback on your product, the the, the better as well. 
Um, but yeah, to your point earlier, so obviously it's, it's an iterative process. Like once you've identified your micro segment, you really want to continue reiterate on it, continue, continuously re, uh, um, looking at the strategy uh, and things like that. Uh, and one interesting thing is to look at micro segments that you may not have been entering, but are like kind of like look alike. Uh, so things that are similar. So if you look at people that use Shopify and Salesforce, well, let's look at other companies that might be similar to them. Are those uh, use cases that might be interesting? Are uh, the integration that you need to build so that you can get into those new uh, micro segments? Cool. Uh, and so this is actually a screenshot of our own campaigns inside our portal. Um, so as you can see, we have very, very specific segments. And I just showcased the first five that we have. But for example, we're able to target companies in the US that like SaaS uh, that have less than 50 employees. And we're targeting the C-level, so maybe like the CEO, the COO. And so we have very, very different messaging than if we target the second one, which would be you know, the SVP of sale, SVP of growth, because uh, obviously there's a different decision process, maybe it's a different value props. Um, uh, and then you know, we have one just for the UK and Ireland, because you, know, you may want to showcase different clients, or you may want to have different messaging for these people. Uh, we have different messaging for people who use Stripe, for example, because we have an integration with them. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to segment it, uh, but it's really, really critical to have those micro segments um, because, as I mentioned, once you have those micro segments, then you can really have your strategy of how you're going to find those leads, how you're going to target, what's the messaging, and what is the flow uh, to move them down the funnel. Got it. So this is almost your way of you know, personalization at scale, right? By, by micro-segmenting, you can actually exactly. speak their language. Uh, exactly. And uh, cool, cool. Great. Uh, so this was the first step. Um, so now that we've covered how to segment your market into micro-segments, uh, let's look at, at how to establish basically channels to acquire qualified leads uh, in each of these micro-segments. Uh, and I often get, you know, the question like, which channel should I be using? Like, should it be inbound versus outbound? Like, email versus going to conferences? And the answer is probably all of the above. Like, you know, like there's so many ways to get into your customers, but it's really about trying the different channels and which one works for your segments, which one works for the the people that you're trying to to go after. Um, obviously. For my past couple of companies, we've really focused on, on outbound, and that's where we've seen the best results. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we've done just outbound. You know, we get leads from inbounds, we put some ads, we go to conferences. Uh, but at Universe, I would say about 85% of new businesses came from outbound campaigns. Uh, wow. And at, Grow, at Grow Labs, currently, it's about 65% uh, of our new business that come from our outbound campaigns. Amazing. Yeah. Cool. And so, kind of like, you know, focusing on outbound campaign and how to get started with this. So, for each of the micro segments that you've, you know, uh, that you've uh, specified in the first step, basically what you want to do is you want to find, you know, companies that match the micro segments criteria. You want to find the decision makers at these companies. Uh, obviously, you'd want to blacklist people you're already in touch with, so your existing clients, maybe competitors, uh, people, you know, you already engage with. Um, and you want to decide the maximum number of contacts at each company. Uh, typically, I would recommend engaging like three to four contacts at the same company, so kind of do like an ABM strategy, but not reaching out to you know 50 people. Like if you're targeting like you know a large organization, they may have 50 VPs of sales, uh, but you don't want to reach out to them all, all at the same time. So you kind of want to do a, a ABM strategy, but but in in, in a smart way. Uh, and then obviously decide who will be reaching out to these prospects. Typically, we see like the, the SDR or the BDR reach out to, to them. Uh, if you're targeting Fortune 500, uh, then it might be someone a little bit higher level, obviously. Got it. And do you ever, on that note, when uh, talking about reaching out to prospects, uh, at Grow Labs, do you guys ever get like executive touches? Like, would you ever send uh, a note from your account to a, a highly targeted uh, prospect to back up your SDRs? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes we do like a two-pawn approach where, you know, we have the SDR reach out and if we don't hear back, then either, you know, the VP of sales or even myself will reach out and say, hey, we haven't heard from you. Um, and obviously, you know, as you scale, the CEO can't necessarily always be involved. Because uh, yeah. what, I, what I really would say to avoid would be, you know, reach out from the CEO 
and then some people respond, but then you know the the SDR takes the demo or so on. Like it, it's kind of a bit of a weird pass pass off. Uh, right. So I would say you know if the CEO is involved, then they should be involved with the, the the account that makes sense for them to be involved with, and they should you know be part of the demos or, or the discussion because um, that that's just best practice in general, I think. Uh, but for myself personally, like I. have not really been involved in a lot of the sales, but for example, when I do a webinar like this, I'll send you know campaign to people who attend the webinar. Uh, I send a bunch of campaigns for some of our partnerships, so we're building a lot of partnerships with you know agencies uh, and other people. So those I'm involved with, um, but definitely not the the day-to-day -day sales. Got it. Makes sense. Yeah. And if you don't mind, let's jump into a question here. Um, yeah. Got one from Jonah, uh, and. Jonah wants to know, so when you say blacklist competitors, you mean your own competitors or companies that are already used competitors? We're in a spot where we're evaluating how much time to invest in reaching out to companies that use a similar product already. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. So definitely what I meant was blacklisting, blacklisting competitors, uh, especially if you do things at scale, you know, you don't necessarily want to reach out to the CEO of, of the company that, you, that you're closely competing with. Uh, but in terms of reaching out to people who use a competing product, uh, it really depends on if you're seeing you know, good traction into having people converting into yours. Uh, so I would say it's good to test it a little bit, um, yeah. but you know, I think there, there, there are pros and cons. I think if it's something that is easily switchable, sure, like you know, switching a, a CRM system is difficult. There's a lot of leads, a lot of data, a lot of adoption, um, so that might be really tricky. But you know, switching some of the tools might not be as tricky. Uh, and again, if the if the value prop is there, and you, you can actually create a campaign specifically showing the value that you have compared to that competitive product, and showing maybe like case studies of people who switch from that product you use, um, then it becomes really really effective. Uh, but again, it really depends on your industry and and, and, and the competitive dynamics. Uh, but we see. You know, clients targeting campaigns are exclusively targeted at, comp at their competitor, or like sorry, companies using their competitors, and it's being very, very effective. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on there. It's always, you know, dependent on where you're at. But I think if you're going to go with something like a rip and replace campaign, uh, the onus is really on your organization to make it as seamless of a process for them to switch over as possible. Yeah, and I would say, you know, I would recommend going with a messaging that is all about the value and how your company adds more value and more benefits versus, you know, trashing the other product. I think, you know, creating that sense of like, hey, we are like the world-class product for this. You may not even need to mention, you know, the other company, just showing them that, you know, people who have switched from a certain system to yours have been seeing uh, that that number of like benefits or, 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 or increase our or, or something like this uh, usually works works really well. Right. Awesome. Thanks, Jonah, for the question. Yeah. And so um, yeah. So basically, once you you know you have all of these filters and everything, what you want to find is you know the number uh, the the right contacts and companies. Uh, try to be as targeted as possible. And if you've done your ideal customer profiles well in the past then it becomes really easy to do so. Uh, and so at Grow Labs, we actually provide you know, that large database uh, with about 340 million searchable contacts across about 8 million companies, uh, and we're getting really, really high engagement rate. Uh, so you know, we have 42% open rate and 11% response rate. Uh, if you compare that to you know, your typical newsletters or, or inbound marketing automation, these are like three to four times higher conversion rates. And that's because we're able to really nail down the targeting and really split all of your segments into those micro segments or micro ideal customer profiles. Um, and so this is kind of like the way we do it. So you know, for my example earlier of people using Stripe, so we're able to target people who are based in the US, who are like an e-commerce platform. Uh, here in that case, it's a campaign for company size of 11 to 50 employees that have raised you know, a sufficient enough amount of funding for the product that we're trying to sell them at, the, at that stage, and then uh, use Stripe as a technology. So coming up with you know, messaging around that then becomes very easy because you can basically speak about, hey, we know you use Stripes, uh, here's what our product 
how our product integrates with Stripe, here's the benefits of all the people using Stripe and how they've used our platform. Uh, so it becomes very, very compelling and it becomes obviously very targeted, which increase the, the conversion rates. Right. Yeah, and so once you've identified basically all of these companies and contacts you want to target, what you want to do is you want to drive a series of very targeted outbound emails. Uh, you want to A-B test you know, both the timing of the emails, but also obviously the content uh, of each email. Uh, so this is just, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so for you guys, who's coming up with this messaging? Is it you know, your marketing department that's putting together templates and then it's driven home by the SDRs, BDRs? Do you allow them to A, B, and test their own personalization? Yeah, so that's a great question. So actually, we almost have, you know, a sort of like competition going where like, you know, I come up with some, some messaging, the sales guys come up with their messaging, uh, you know, marketing team come up with some of the messaging. And, you know, instead of like, like debating for hours, we, we just try it. And so we may have, you know, three campaigns going at the same time, uh, going to very similar people in the same market. And, you know, we A-B test the subject line, we A-B test the content of the email, and just see what works better. And, you know, it's very difficult until you actually try to know exactly what's going to resonate best. Uh, so we really take the approach of let's look at the numbers and from there decide what works better. I like that. Yeah, it takes the, the bias right out of it and just show me the numbers. If you got a good one, let's use it. Exactly. Cool. Uh, so yeah, so this is how we test it. So you can see here we have an e-commerce with less than 50 employees, version 1, versus the version B, and then we send those emails and then see the, the conversion for, for all of them. Um, and so I wanted to spend a little bit of time, uh, especially you know, for those people who are just getting started with outbound, um, to tell you a little bit more about the outbound campaign sequence. Um, it's important to have at least five to eight touch points in a sequence because uh, you know most people, uh, most of your sales reps are going to give up after a couple of emails, maybe three emails. You know, if if, if they if they're really persistent, uh, so it's really important to have this, this persistence. Persistence, but it's also really important to have a content that adds value, and it's not just you know I'm just following, up, I'm just following up. Um, so I'm going to post on this slide for a couple of minutes, uh, but basically. Here's a typical type of sequence that we, we have for us. And really the first email is about you know, how to, to tell them about, about you, like the credibility, tell them you know, overall what you're doing, uh, and then set up you know, a follow-up email. Again, the goal is to create like four more, like fear of missing out if you know some of the competitors, some people in the industry that are using your product. Maybe people that have switched from one competitor to you, then show them the value that they've, 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 they've generated. Uh, mm -hmm. Then it's good to follow up with content, so, you know, like a case study, an ebook, something that you know they may not be ready to purchase. They may just need more information, more education. Uh, so it's really good to to send that. Uh, then we typically recommend like a, a small, like two line check in, like, hey, I just want to make sure you receive my first email. Was the case study interesting or valuable? Something like that. And then continuing with that approach of like, hey, let's follow up, build some credibility, share some valuable content, uh, all the way to you know the last email. Um, and, and it's funny, like a lot of people say, like, oh, you know, five, six, seven emails is too much. But if you actually done your research, you know, split your customer to the right segments, have the right messaging, uh, then we have a lot of positive responses happening email five, six, seven, and eight. Uh, and so, you know, it, 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 it is really important if you've done your research and, and you, you actually end up seeing the, the results. That's awesome. So it's like a fully educational process from, from start to finish. I have a question around building credibility just from the get-go. Uh, you know, it can be super hard when you're trying to build your own credibility. Is there any ways that you guys do that that's uh, unique? Yeah, so again, I, I, we're very you know, numbers driven and I think the numbers speak for themselves. And so you know, instead of saying, hey, we're the best company at doing this, we show the value you know, we say, uh, and we show like the impact that we have. So we may have an, an email where we say like, hey, we work with 250 of the top B2B sales teams and we help them increase their sales by 30 to 40 percent a month while when they switch to us. So that's you know like that shows the that you know we're having an impact, we're working with with those teams. And then you know if you have some good logos, some good plans, for example, we may add add something wrong. Um, hey, we work with leading companies like Cisco and PandaDoc, 
and all these companies that they may have heard of. And again, that builds that credibility uh, right from the ground up versus saying, oh, we're the best at this, or we're much better than this other platform. I think showing the numbers and showing actual finds uh, helps a lot. Makes total sense. Just cutting through the fluff and getting straight to the, the examples. Exactly. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so just a few emails, I guess, tips uh, on, on, your, on your outbound campaigns, because obviously outbound needs to be personal. Uh, you need to, like, it needs to feel like you've done your research. Uh, and again, if you've done your ICPs the right way, it's a lot easier. Uh, but try to keep them short. You know, the attention span these days is extremely short. Uh, the, every word that you put that, you know, you don't have to put is going to cost you a point in conversion. So it's really important to be short and, and concise. Um, you know, keep things simple. Um, if, you know, like there's a lot of buzzwords out there, but like try to explain things in, in, in a simple language that people are going to understand from the get-go. Um, and yeah, number four, which I, is kind of my personal favorite, because I, I do think people buy a lot based on that, but I like, try to create for more like fear of missing out. If you're able to show them you know, what they're missing out from not using you, if you know, you're able to show them some of their competitors that are using your product to get an edge, that's really, really, really powerful. Uh, and again, if you've done your ICPs in the right way, that's a lot easier to do. Uh, we've talked about credibility, which is really important. Uh, and then the final piece is, you know, use your own voice and style. I think it's really important to be professional, but you also want to, you know, use your own your own voice, uh, your own language, uh, and don't don't just copy and paste, you know, any template that you're going to find out there. Because uh, even if you your messaging, uh, it, 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 also your product is good, if your messaging doesn't resonate and doesn't, you know, doesn't reflect your brand, then people are, are likely not going to convert. Awesome. And we just have another uh, question here as well. Um, from Philippe, uh, just around, can you give me an example uh, of how you would create FOMO in an email? Yeah, um, so you know, one of the campaigns that we do is around, you know, competitors. So for example, as you start getting, so like, let's say one of our, um, one of our micro segments for Grabs is uh, marketing agencies. So you know the first few first few clients that we onboard, we kind of like build a really strong relationship and ask them if we can use them as collateral. And so then we have a specific campaign where we use their names and the return that they're getting. So it's like, hey, marketing campaign, a uh, marketing agency X Y Z is using us and is seeing this amount of results. And and a marketing uh, sorry and and um, marketing agency B is using us and is able to close deals with these three Fortune 500 companies. So being able to really show the value from people that they know in their industry uh, is very, very powerful. It's a lot more powerful and you're going to create a lot of like more fear of missing out if they know the companies you're mentioning. And it, even it better if like they're competing with them, you know, like, comp like marketing agencies, they know all the marketing agencies and if they know that those marketing agencies that are competing with them uh, are using your product to get, to get a competitive edge, then that's really, really powerful. Sorry, I think I, I lost you for a second. Oh, no, no worries. Are, are you back? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm back. Okay, so that, yeah, that, go ahead. Does it, make, does it make sense in terms of like creating a fear of missing out by mentioning, you know, companies that they would know in their industries? Absolutely, yeah, no, it makes, uh, makes total sense. Cool, sweet. Like um, yeah, and so this is just, again, I want to caution people, like don't take this for granted, like this is just a template. Uh, it's really, really important to customize it. Uh, but this is an example of like, you know, the level of customization. It's really important that you know, when you reach out to these companies, uh, it feels like it's a customized email. Obviously, use you know, automation to send those, uh, but definitely uh, make sure that all of the merge tags are correct. Make sure like, you know, it feels like you've done your research. Uh, and again, the more customized you can be based on the industry that they're in and the customers, that the value that the customers that are in this industry are seeing, uh, the better. And okay. obviously, I have, a, I have a really strong call to action at the beginning. Um, you know, I, I think what we try to do is try to get them on a phone call, depending on the sales cycle. Obviously, if you have like very high volume number of sales, you may want to send them to a landing page when to automatically sign up. 
uh, but a lot of the time, you know, um, for B2B at least, you do a lot of like, you know, let's get on a demo, let's do a quick phone call to chat more, uh, and these are still fairly effective. Uh, we try to, you know, entice them with a 15 minute uh, demo, because uh, typically within 15 minutes you're able to do, to know if it's a good fit, and if it's a good fit, then, you know, you can go a bit longer and dive down into the product and the, and the demo. Yeah, I, I definitely agree there. I think gone are the days when, you know, people will agree to a 30 or 45 minute uh, demo right off the get-go. It's just, it's just too long, and it, you know, they, uh, they can't see the value within 15 minutes, and you got to switch them up. Yeah, and, and, and again, adapt this, the, the pitch to the different decision makers. Like if you're targeting the CEO of startups, you know, 15 minutes might be a lot. Maybe they only need five minutes to see overall if it's the right fit for their business. And at the end of the day, if it is, then they might introduce you to the VP of sales who would actually spend the time to do the demo and see if, you know, they, they can implement that for their company, uh, for, the, for their business. But maybe, you know, just a five minute with the CEO is all you need. Totally. Um, of course, this is just a, you know, an example of a follow-up, like kind of like a two-liner, you know, you don't really need to add more than that. Uh, obviously, you know, people are busy sending a two-liner, putting yourself at the top of the inbox uh, is important. Uh, and then just something professional um, and just, just to check in. Uh, and this is an example for an ebook. Um, again, you know, it's really important to show credibility. So here you can see in the middle, we say, hey, we work with over 14,000 clients and we've had them do something, you know, something beneficial or benefit that, that they're going to they're gonna see valuable. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, any other questions on the outbound kind of like email campaign before we switch into optimizing the, the flow? No, I think that was a great, uh, great breakdown. And, of course, it's one of those things, uh, just like we were talking about before, it's got to just constantly evolve, you know, that messaging that you do um, as your your business and uh, your industry just evolves. Great. Um, so yeah, so let's move into this part, which basically, you know, now that you've identified the channels, how to reach out to them, how to customize your email, uh, the next step to building your outbound sales machine is how to efficiently uh, move the leads down the sales funnel. Uh, so in this session, in this section, we'll look at you know some of the steps in the funnel. Obviously, depending on your business and who you're targeting, you have to adjust them a little bit. Um, but typically, you know, when you reach out to leads in different micro segments, um, you kind of like move them down a marketing landing pages, uh, then you move them to a demo, and then you negotiate them, uh, or negotiate the contract or the proposal, uh, and then you want to onboard them and, uh, and renew and upsell them. Uh, so the first step is, you know, is typically to get them to a marketing landing page. Uh, I really try to recommend adding a micro, uh, a micro segmented landing page. Um, and so basically, if you can see on the Square website, they have like dozens of verticals that they're going after, and for each of them, they have a dedicated marketing landing page. And you know, these days, it's actually not that difficult to create that. There's a lot of software that help you customize or create you know, good landing pages, even without the need of developers. And what I really like about the one from Square is that they're actually, you know, creating FOMO and building credibility right there in their uh, marketing landing pages. You can see like the one for SPA, it's saying that they have 100,000 SPA treatments sold with Square. And again, here you can see that it's a kind of like, it's not necessarily sneaky, but it's like, you know, they, they don't have 100,000 SPA companies using them. They have 100,000 SPA treatments that they process to Square, which obviously is a lot less but it still looks like it's very, very impressive. So, you know, if I'm a, the owner of a spa and I look at this and I'm like, oh, wow, this is actually really impressive, I should see why these companies are using it and what are the benefits for my business. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, we've just got one more uh, question here, if you don't mind jumping in, from uh, Cindy. A um, little bit off the topic, but the question is, uh, many companies have, you know, different demo requests, some offer free trials or even freemiums. Uh, in your experience, uh, how do you know which one is right for you? You mean which business model is right offering like a free trial versus a freemium model? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it really depends. And yeah, definitely a little bit off, off topic, but I'll come back to topic in a sec. But basically, you know, it really depends on how many people you're targeting uh, you know, if, and, and how much money you're making 
uh, from these people, right? So if you're talking the Fortune 500 and you know you're gonna make six, seven figures from a, any deal, you know, doing a freemium model uh, or, or a free trial may not make sense. There may be a lot of implementation costs needed. Um, you know, however, on the opposite side of the spectrum, you know, maybe you're targeting anyone in marketing or any sales rep. In which point, you know, maybe uh, being able to do a freemium model so where they can see the value, uh, and then you know, if they like it, they can they can upsell it. Um, and there's everything in between, obviously. Uh, so I think it really depends on one, who you're trying to target, how big of a market, uh, how easy is it to implement and switch to, and then two is like you know, in terms of a product, are you able to create kind of like a do-it-yourself product that people can onboard themselves on, because uh, it's very difficult to do, you know, a free or, or freemium model if it's going to cost you money to onboard all these people and may or may not lead into a deal. Uh, so you have to carefully analyze kind of like the market, you know, the flows from the product standpoint and how much drop-off you have uh, using one model versus the other. Uh, so I'm not really uh, answering the question, um, but it's very, very business specific. You know, every model works. Uh, you know, if you look at Slack, they grew from a female model to like a billion dollar business. Uh, if you look at, you know, some of the companies that are targeting Fortune 500, like MuleSoft, they grew to like you know, a billion dollar business doing like six, seven figure contracts with no, no trial. Um, so anything can work. It's really a matter of like who you're trying to target and uh, what's the best the best flow uh, to move people down the funnel for you. Got it. Yeah, that was some uh, some great insight. And thank you uh, for the question. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, cool. But yeah, so for people you know do demos and 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 counter uh, and, and demo requests. Uh, again, it's really important to build an efficient process for that. Whether it's you know you're doing outbound or inbound, you want to. I have an easy way for people to, to schedule the demos. Uh, we use you know, Calendly for that, where people can view the calendar of all our sales reps and take a time that works for them, and basically runs Robin. It sends them a confirmation email. It adds a calendar invite to their, um, to their calendar, and then it sends full up a reminder, and they have an option to reschedule. So it kind of like takes that off the sales rep's plate so that they are more effective and they have more time to uh, you know, speak to people who are actually interested in, in, in closing deals. Yeah, that can be one of the most frustrating things as a, as a sales rep is trying to manage your calendar and juggling all a bunch of different uh, people's uh, schedules. Absolutely. And one of the other pain points of the sales rep, I think, is you know, getting the proposals out and you know, having an efficient way for them to customize the proposal, do some iterations. Uh, is really, really important. Uh, so we, for example, we use PandaDoc, which is a really easy way to uh, sync with your CRM so people can create the, the deals uh, and the proposal inside your CRM and then send them to clients, you know, sometimes modify them as the negotiation go. Uh, so it's a lot easier to do that and, you know, the ROI just makes so much sense. Like, I don't really understand anyone who does, uh, you know, PDF contract this day without a, with a, a signature. Uh, and one thing that is interesting with that is that now you days you can actually attach payments to the contract. So instead of having to have people you know sign the contract and then your billing team or your or your accounting team has to follow up to get the payment information, how about you combine that inside the uh, the proposal? They just enter the you know bank information or uh, um, or credit card, and then you know you can charge them right from from there. So you don't have to have back and forth, and that has significantly helped us you know, collect payments and reduce the friction and again, save so much time for, for your sales reps. Absolutely, that, that's great. It's something you can, you know, turn around and apply right away, which would uh, you know, definitely boost that win rate for sure. Yeah, and so these are kind of like the main, you know, uh, flows in the funnel. Uh, once you've optimized all of this, it's all about, you know, measuring, uh, seeing where you have drop off, things, things you can improve and then you know, optimizing it and, and scaling it. Uh, and so that's what we've you know, done at, at Grow Labs. Uh, the thing that we look at, obviously, you know, in the sales pipeline and things are like the number of opportunities created, uh, the opportunities by status, like how are they moving down the funnel. Um, one that is really, really important and that people tend to forget is the stage duration. Like how long does it take for people to move from you know, a demo to a proposal, from a proposal 
to being onboarded, from onboarded to actually using the product. Uh, this is really, really important, uh, and you want to you want to reduce the time uh, that it takes for people to move down the funnel. Um, one that we you know always like to look at is the close loss reason why are people are not switching over to you. Is it the pricing? Is it a different model? And that's going to infer you know a lot of other things around your strategy, around maybe your product and things that need to change, uh, and around the competition as well, uh, which is really important. Um, the other one that we look at is the close one source. So basically, looking at people who are converting and where do they come from? Do they come from this webinar? Do they come from your outbound outreach? Do they come from this campaign versus that campaign. So tracking really exactly what is the first source of the lead is really important because that's going to infer into where you should spend most of your time and most of your money going forward. Um, yeah. Just on that point, then, how let's say uh, you know a lead comes in and let's say you know you did a webinar, but then they went and downloaded an ebook. You also met you know someone at a conference. How where do you where do you uh, Put the attribution there. Is it the first touch point? Is it the last? Yeah. So I mean, ideally, it's all of them, right? Ideally, you're able to say like, okay, like a multi-touch campaign results in you know the best conversion, and you know we're able to get people at the webinar first, and then we hit them with an ad, and then you know we send them an email, and that's what's converting them. Uh, obviously, that's a little bit difficult to do. Uh, there are a bunch of software that help you do that, uh, but being able just to track, you know, at least the first one, I would say, is, is really, really important. Um, and you know, trying to to at least see the journey of, of what happened, like being able to to see, okay, like you send them an email, they open it a couple of times, they click on one of your ad. Uh, obviously, with ad, it, it's a little bit difficult because you're not necessarily able to correlate who's clicking on what. Uh, although that's changing uh, quite a bit, so we are about to release a new thing with Scroll Apps where you'll be able to proactively uh, target uh, people that you're reaching out to via email with specifically specific ads, and you can actually change the ads based on who clicks on what, uh, where they are down the funnel, uh, and that's really going to change the game into how you you, you track things. Uh, but I would say you know the more data points you have around. Um, where the leads come from and how much it costs you. You know, maybe like an ad costs you X amount of dollars versus doing a campaign versus doing a webinar versus attending a conference. Uh, then you'll be able to track not only where they come from but also what's your cost of user acquisition, uh, which obviously is really important as you as you keep scaling. Absolutely, got it. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, and so this is uh, you know what we look at. Uh, so we look at our funnel, obviously how many leads come from outbound versus inbound versus referrals, uh, and then how they move down the funnel. Uh, so this is the, on, on average for the past 30 days, and we actually look at you know, per rep. So how many leads do the reps get? Uh, how many are moving into ops? How many are engaged? How many are in negotiation? All the way to how many have been won and, and are now becoming uh, clients. Uh, and so then from there what you can do is you look at the qualified ops, you know, divided by the number of days, uh, the average lifetime value, which obviously varies from, from every single business, and then you can actually see how much qualified ops you're generating per rep uh, per day. Um, and then from there in your conversion rate, you can really identify and see you know, how many reps you need to hit your numbers, how can you scale, and what are the, you know, the, the channels that, that actually make sense for, you, for your business. Yeah, that's uh, that's super helpful. I remember we will be uh, sending out this deck, so uh, everyone can can steal that little equation at the bottom. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think we went through all of this, you know, from looking at all of your different segments and micro segmenting them to looking at the different channels that you can use and how you can move people down the funnel. And as you build all these pieces, it's really important to track, you know. How are people moving down the funnel? What is the conversion rate? Where are people dropping off? Uh, and try to optimize that. And keeping in mind, you know, what's the average um, value that people are deriving from products? How are you maximizing this? And then how how fast are you moving people down the funnel? Because as you scale, the, the the time it takes for people to move down the funnel is really really important. Because that's that's how fast you're going to recoup uh, the money that you're investing into your sales and marketing. Got it. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. I think I think that's it. I think we covered most of it.
I love it. Well, that was great. Thanks uh, very much yeah. again. Dan. Thank um, you. So I was hoping. Well, there is a few more questions here. So uh, we'll, we'll probably have time for one or two more. Uh, but I was hoping that you could also just share uh, a little bit more about uh, Grow Labs, what you do, uh, and how you help salespeople. Yeah, for sure. So basically, Grow Labs, um, we work with B two B companies, and we help them with two things. One is the lead generation. So really, how to find your ideal customer profiles and find the right uh, people to reach out to. And so we have a really large database, uh, about 340 million verified leads all over the world. Uh, and so we have those companies find who they want to target. And then from there, we have them with the outreach. So we have an outbound outreach solution that basically help them uh, target people with the right messaging at the right time, move them down all the funnel. Uh, so we use machine learning to optimize when to send the emails, who to send the emails to, when to follow up. And then when people actually respond, we analyze all these responses and we triage them. So when you do outbound, obviously there's a lot of you know, out of offices, or maybe it's not the right time for the person, maybe they're not the right person. So we actually analyze that and triage and do the right action uh, and only pass the qualified leads to the sales reps. Uh, so the sales reps only get you know, positive responses into their inbox, uh, which really help them save time, save money, and really focus on talking to qualified leads, uh, which is you know, what they should be doing uh, so they can close more deals. So really our goal is to make the outbound um, sales and marketing flow as efficient as possible and really help B2B team basically grow faster. Great. Yeah, that's the, the ideal world of a salesperson if you can just be on uh, the phone talking to qualified candidates all day. That's the, it's, that's the it's dream. A, it's magic. Like our sales <laughs> guys, like each of them, they do between 8 to 12 new qualified demo every single day. Uh, and the only way they're able to do that is because that's all they do. Like they don't really have to do anything else other than you know following up and, and sending the contract. But most of their time is spent on you know building relationship, talking to people, showing the value that we can bring, and actually how we're using our own tools to you know be super efficient. And and when people realize that, uh, then they want to do the same for their own company. And so um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been very efficient for us. Yeah, eight to twelve demos a day. That's that's crazy. That's that's great. Um, okay, so jumping into uh, just got uh, two questions here. So one from uh, Sarah. So we have a problem with stale outbound opportunities. They, they get qualified, but then the project has been on hold or something. How do you make sure that these aren't skewing your forecast numbers? Yeah, so, so I, I guess follow-up question would be like, why are they on, on hold? Like are they you know, signed but not onboarded? Or, um, but you know, it's, it's really important to once you built your your sale like your sales funnels and you know the, the criteria, um, it's really important to customize the stages. So you really want to customize stages that fits with your business model. Uh, you know, if you look at Salesforce or like I think pretty much any CRM, they have pre-built stages, but you really want to go in and customize your stages to your business model so you can actually see where people are stuck. And so you know, for you, you may have a stage that is like you know, signed but not onboarded. And so based on that, uh, you can actually put them into a new sequence of emails that automatically follow them. And maybe it's coming not from the sales rep, maybe it's coming from the customer success team at this point. So it's really important that you really map where people go in their journey and where they get stuck so that you can unstuck them with the right automation or look at your product and say, like, oh, why are these people, you know, on hold? Like why are they not responding to, to this step in the process uh, and really deep down and, and, and that way you'd be able, if you have the right stages, you'd be able to have the right metric, the right funnel and really see um, what's going on into, into, your, into your funnel. One more uh, question before we wrap up here. Uh, so lots of companies are now implementing a website chat for lead gen. Uh, yep. What best practices do you use for chat? Yeah, so I think it's really important that chat, you know, is part of your strategy. Because uh, obviously, you know, when people come to your website, uh, you know, it's it's really important that you, especially the one that are variable. So I think it's really important to be able to score. So having a chat system that allows you to score the leads and you know close the loop. 
because uh, I think you know the old old way of thinking was like, hey, let's send them bombard them with a lot of emails that are untargeted, get them to the website, fill in some forms, and then maybe or maybe not they get to sales, and sales can qualify them. Whereas like now you actually able to you know find exactly who you want to target, and you know when they come to your website, then you know you can know who they are and what value and how big of a priority they are, and if they're top priority, you should be, you should have your sales reps reach out really fast and ping them, and so, you know, I think the intercom drifts of the world are, are doing a really good job at this, uh, definitely, you know, on the sales and marketing, I think Drift is doing an amazing job uh, from a customer success standpoint, uh, intercom is really strong into moving people who are already using product uh, down the funnel. Um, so I think these are these are really good tools, and there are more and more you know chat tools uh, being being used every day, uh, and I think it helps you know build a conversion and, and build a relationship, which is which is exactly what what you want uh, to do. Uh, so I would say use the tools that you know integrate with your current flow, um, and that are going to be able to bring your best value deals to your sales reps as, as fast as possible. Excellent. Well, that uh, looks like it's our, our time. Uh, ben, thank you so much again for all uh, your insight. Uh, it was super helpful to me. So Yeah, thanks uh, for the time. Yeah, and to everyone who joined us today, thank you for your time as well, and uh, have an awesome week.